the system of equations. We must deal with them all at once. Always looking for solutions. Positive outlook overcome. Hello, my name is Roy Simpson, professor of mathematics at Cosumnes River College in Sacramento, California. This video is the final video in a series on the characteristic equation for linear algebra. This is actually a subtopic, but a very important subtopic because we will be using this content as we move through the course. And that content is all about something called similarity. So let's talk about what it means for matrices to be similar. If we have two square matrices, A and B, of the same size, then A and B are said to be similar if there is an invertible matrix P such that P inverse A P is equal to B. Now this is actually a transformation. You have some matrix you're plugging into the transformation and it turns it into the matrix B. The operation that happens on that matrix A or the function that's happening to it is P inverse times that A times P. That's the machine that you're plugging A into. So two matrices A and B are similar. If you can find an invertible matrix P or whatever letter you want to use such that P inverse A times P is equal to B, that other matrix. By the way, because P is invertible, you can multiply both sides on the left by P and on the right by P inverse to find out that A is equal to P, B, P inverse. So this basically proves that if A is similar to B, then B is similar to A. And I saw that I had a typo, so I just changed it. The matrix transformation A into P inverse AP is called a similarity transformation. I had it written incorrectly as P inverse BP, but it's P inverse AP there. Sorry about that. But that's called the similarity transformation. And again, that's exactly what we're saying here. We just have a transformation that takes a matrix A and turns it into a matrix B by multiplying A on the left by the inverse of an invertible matrix and on the right by the invertible matrix itself. Now I have a few notes about similarity before we move forward. The first note is kind of a justification as to why we're learning about similarity transformations. It's because the similarity transformation is related to the change of basis, but there are actually other reasons why we're doing it. The second note is that the matrices that are similar to each other actually need not be invertible. The only piece of a similarity transformation that needs to be invertible is the actual matrix P that you're multiplying on the left and the right by. Well, on the right by P and on the left by P inverse. But anyhow, that's the only invertible matrix involved in the transformation itself. Again, I, I really want to drive this point home. You have like a space here of matrices. So you can think of each of these little points as representing a matrix and it gets transformed into this other space right here via a linear transformation T. And so if I have a matrix A in this space, it can be transformed into the matrix B via the similarity transform that takes some invertible matrix P and performs that action on A and the resulting matrix in the end is actually B. The third note that you can see down below is that similarity is not equality. That is, A and B are not equal. They have a lot of properties that equalities have, but they are not equal. So A and B are not equal, they're similar. We'll talk about why a lot of people get these things confused in a moment when we bring up the properties of similarities. Finally, as a concept, we would love to transform a given matrix A into a triangular matrix B because so many operations in linear algebra run more smoothly if the given matrix is triangular. And that is the point of the similarity transformation. I would love to take some matrix A that's terrible looking and multiply it on the left and right by the inverse of a matrix and the matrix itself to transform that ugly matrix into a triangular matrix. And then I could worry about taking determinants or finding eigenvalues from that resulting matrix. So again, the whole point of a similarity transformation is to make our work a lot easier in the long run. Now, what I'm gonna do here is go through about three different theorems 
and prove each one of them. And each of these is actually true for equality statements as well. And that's why I think a lot of people get similarities and equalities kind of confused. They think, oh, A is similar to B means A is equal to B. Well, the reason why people think that is because there's a lot of similarity, not to really use the word we want to be using for something else here, but there's a lot of similarity between equalities and similarities. For example, the reflexive property, any square matrix is similar to itself. Well, that's actually true about matrices being equal to themselves. Any matrix is actually equal to itself. And that's why some people think that similarity means equality, but it doesn't, even though they both have that property, the reflexive property. So again, if A is a square matrix, it is similar to itself. The proof is actually not too bad. By definition of similarity, A is similar to A if we can find an invertible matrix P such that P inverse times A times P is equal to A. That is by definition what similarity is. So a matrix A is similar to a matrix A if we can find an invertible matrix P such that P inverse AP is equal to A. Well, I can easily find an invertible matrix P such that P inverse times A times P is equal to A. The identity matrix actually is an invertible matrix such that the inverse of the identity matrix, which is the identity matrix, times A times the identity matrix is actually equal to A. So we've found an invertible matrix such that P inverse AP is equal to A. There just needs to be one and then I can say, great, A is similar to, well, A. And again, like I said, this is part of the reason why people get similarities and equalities confused because for any matrix A, it is equal to itself. Well, for any matrix A, it is similar to itself as well. Another property that equalities and similarities have in common, they're symmetric. If A is similar to B, then B is similar to A. Just like if I told you A is equal to B, well, that implies B is equal to A. So again, that property exists for equalities as well as similarities. But again, when I tell you that A is similar to B, that doesn't mean that A is equal to B. It's just that equalities have the symmetric property. Well, let's go ahead and let A be similar to B. We'll want to arrive at B being similar to A. Well, if A is similar to B, then we know there has to be some invertible matrix P somewhere in the universe such that P inverse times A times P turns into B. Remember, the similarity transformation is actually a transformation. It'll take your matrix A and turn it into P inverse A P, which in this case we're saying is B. Well, let's see. If we go ahead and make just a real quick name change here, letting Q equal P inverse. So instead of P inverse AP, I'll call that Q A Q inverse. Or better yet, I'll just leave it like that. And maybe I'll go ahead and multiply on the left by Q inverse and on the right by Q. So multiplying the left-hand side of the equation by Q inverse on the left and the right side of the left-hand side of the equation by Q. Well, I have to do that same action on the other side as well. So Q inverse on the left, Q on the right. But something is interesting about this statement. Remember what we said that Q is equal to. Q is equal to P inverse. So this statement, Q inverse P inverse, which is this statement right here. Well, if Q is P inverse, then Q inverse is P inverse inverse, which we know is P, and P times P inverse is the identity matrix. So all of this yellow highlighting right here is just the identity matrix. Likewise, P times Q. Well, remember, Q is P inverse. So that's P times P inverse, which again is the identity matrix. So all the blue highlighting is the identity matrix. We get down to this guy right here, and of course, the identity matrix times A times the identity matrix is just A. And you get that A is equal to Q inverse B Q. Huh. That means that A is the result of B being multiplied on the left by an invertible matrix and on the right by the matrix itself. Well, that's a similarity transformation. 
So therefore B must be similar to A because again, remember the similarity transformation just takes a matrix and turns it into that matrix, but multiplied on the left by an invertible matrix and on the right by that matrix non-inverted. And that's exactly what's happening here. Thus, B is similar to A. So again, we started with let A be similar to B. We arrived at B must be similar to A. Pretty nice property, pretty easy to prove. Whenever you're dealing with similarities, actually the work is much easier than proving stuff like, oh, prove that the sum of A and B is the same thing as the sum of B and A. That ends up being a little bit of a tough proof because you have to reference entries within those matrices and that ends up being a little bit of a bear early on in this course. Finally, we have the transitive property. The transitive property is actually a really good property to know, just the name of it even. In terms of equalities, if I told you that A is equal to B and B is equal to C, well then it should make sense that A must be equal to C. That's the transitive property of equality. However, similarity transformations have the same property. If A is similar to B and B is similar to C, then A must be similar to C. And again, this is another reason why a lot of people think that, oh, two matrices being similar means they're equal. No, it's not true. It's just that they have a lot of the same properties. So let's start by letting A be similar to B and B be similar to C. Well, by the definition of similarity, there must exist invertible matrices P and Q such that P inverse times A times P is equal to B. That is, A gets transformed via a similarity transformation into B. And there has to be a Q that's invertible such that B gets transformed into C via a similarity transform. But what can we do with that? Well, if I take a look at this equation right here, and if I multiply the left-hand side of that equation by Q inverse, and remember, I'll multiply both sides of it by Q inverse, and if I multiply the right side of that equation by Q, well, I get this equality right here, but notice that in this statement down here, I said that's equal to C. Well, you could kind of see off to the right-hand side right up here why I said that, because Q inverse B Q is actually C. But what I want to show is that A is similar to C. I need to show that there are some matrix such that the inverse of that matrix times A times the matrix itself should equal C. And I'm kind of looking at it right here. By properties of inverses of matrices, recall that Q inverse times P inverse is the same thing as P times Q inverse. So this chunk right here can be rewritten as P times Q inverse times A times the quantity P times Q. Well, notice that is the inverse of a matrix times A times the matrix itself is equal to C. That is, A is being transformed into C via a similarity transformation. And I say that here, since P and Q are invertible, then the product is invertible, hence A is similar to C. So these properties are really nice and easy to prove um, but I just want to showcase them because a lot of people get them confused uh, when they work with similarity transformations. They think that means the matrices are equal and they're totally not. And remember, A and B do not even have to be invertible. I have a clarification on this page, but I don't really need to read it because, well, I should actually. I've been kind of harping on this the entire video, but let's go ahead and just say it. Equalities also have these three previous qualities which is why many students think that similarity is equality, but it's not. However, similarity of matrices is what we call an equivalence relation. We don't need that here, but I'm just letting you know that's exactly what it's called. And it's because it has a lot of the properties of equalities. So let's finally get to an example. Check that P is non-singular. Remember, that's a, another way of saying that P is invertible. And then compute the similarity transformation of P on A. That is, compute P inverse A, P, right? Because we want to take A and transform it into that. All right, first we're going to show that P is invertible. Now, I could just quickly take a determinant to determine whether or not P is invertible. But the reality is we're going to need to find P inverse anyway. So let's just go ahead and go through the entire row reduction process to find P inverse. 
Remember, you have multiple ways to find the inverse of a matrix at this point. You could technically find the inverse via the adjoint if you wanted to. I don't want to. I just prefer the good old fashioned row reduction technique. All right, so we arrive at P inverse right there. So we started with P, we arrive at P inverse, and now we just wanna know what is the matrix that we get from the similarity transformation P inverse AP. Remember, that product P inverse AP will give us a similar matrix to A. To save room, I'm just gonna write out P inverse times A, and then I'll write the letter P for the matrix P. I'll fill that in when I'm done with this product. That product right there is P inverse times A. It was a little bit of a hefty lift there. Now I'm gonna go ahead and write in what P is, and we'll take this product. All right, so that is a similarity transformation of A via these invertible matrices P and P inverse. So I'll call that the matrix B. Of course, somebody handed me the invertible matrix P to get to this point, but let's pretend as though we could create that matrix P to get to this point right here. This allows us to use an incredibly powerful theorem. Remember, we've been working on eigenvectors and eigenvalues and trying to determine eigenvalues this entire time, although this video hasn't presented that issue yet. But suppose that we were handed this matrix and asked, Hey, what are the eigenvalues of that matrix? Well, if we could easily create P such that P is invertible so that we can get A to be transformed into a similar matrix, then the following theorem is very useful. This is theorem four in a textbook that I use, and it says the following. If two square matrices of the same size are similar, they have to be of the same size anyway, they have the same characteristic polynomial and hence the same eigenvalues with the same exact multiplicities. That is, if somebody hands you a matrix A and you can transform it via the similarity transformation into a brand new matrix B that is triangular or what we just did, diagonal, then you could just read off the eigenvalues from that triangular matrix. That is, the eigenvalues of A are identical to the eigenvalues of our resulting transformed matrix. That is, the eigenvalues for the matrix A are negative one, three, negative one, or in other words, negative one, three, where negative one has multiplicity two. Now you could probably see that's very powerful, right? Oh, by the way, this comes from the fact that we have a theorem that says, hey, the eigenvalues of a triangular matrix are just the entries along the main diagonal. Now, I don't wanna just hand you that theorem and not prove it. So let's go ahead and go to prove it. But before we do, I wanna mention that you're probably looking at this and saying, um, am I, is somebody just gonna come in the room and hand me this magical matrix P that forces my, uh, my matrix A to become triangular and similar? And as you probably have seen throughout linear algebra, the answer to that is obviously no, but if we present a theorem like this and an action like this, it usually is because you can find that matrix P pretty easily. I don't wanna say easily actually, but without a ton of effort. But we're gonna do that in a different video. For now, let's go ahead and prove that theorem. Suppose that A is similar to B. That's the very beginning of this theorem. That's what we would call the antecedent. And before I continue any further, I should mention that as I wrote out this proof, I guess I was thinking a different order of things. So I'm gonna mention a little thing before I move forward. Then B is similar to A. By the way, this actually is not needed for the proof, but the way I wrote the proof, it ends up being required. I have to kind of do it this way. My fault for writing the proof a specific way. So if B is similar to A, that implies that there exists some matrix P such that P inverse B, P is equal to A. Now that I have that written down, I can go ahead and write the rest of this out or, or reveal the rest of this. Then the determinant of A minus lambda I, well, A, again, just from what we wrote over here, A is equal to P inverse B, P. So that's what I have there. Traded out A 
for P inverse B, P. Remember, we proved earlier that if A is similar to B, then B is similar to A, and that's why I wrote it this way. Of course, if that's true, then we could write the identity matrix actually as P inverse I, P. That should make sense because the identity matrix times P is just P, and so P inverse times P is just the identity matrix. All this right here is just the same thing as the identity matrix. But what we're gonna do is a little bit of factoring. We'll factor P inverse off the left-hand side of those. We'll also factor P off the right-hand side of those. And properties of determinants, which I actually showcased in the previous video, the video right before this, the determinant of products is the product of determinants. Now, all of those are scalars now. Determinant of a matrix is just a scalar. And so we can commute those around. And we know that the determinant of P inverse is one over the determinant of P. So those determinants of P will cancel beautifully and it becomes the determinant of B minus lambda I. What have we shown? That the determinant of A minus lambda I is equal to the determinant of B minus lambda I. Remember, the characteristic equation is just this determinant equaling zero. But that determinant equaling zero is the same as this determinant equaling zero. Therefore, the characteristic equations for similar matrices are the same. And notice I use the word or the phrase characteristic polynomial. That's just the result of the characteristic equation. So two similar matrices have the same characteristic polynomial. And because you solve that characteristic equation or that characteristic polynomial equation to find the eigenvalues, and they're the same equations, they must have the same eigenvalues. And because they have the same eigenvalues, they'll have the same multiplicities on those eigenvalues. Now that theorem can be used to show that if you have two similar matrices, their determinants are equal as well. Let those two matrices be similar. By the way, uh, some people use a notation right here, but I actually do not use that notation because I use that notation for row equivalence. And so I don't want to use that here. Otherwise it will confuse people who have been watching my videos. Uh, so I just say let A and B be similar. Well, then there exists an invertible matrix P such that P inverse A P is equal to B. This is the same definition we've used over and over again in this video. By the way, I'm assuming that all of these matrices are N by N. Well, then the determinants of both sides have to be equal. And we know that the determinant of a product is the product of determinants. But we know that the determinant of P inverse is one over the determinant of P. So these two will cancel beautifully. And you get that the determinant of the original matrix is equal to the de determinant of the similar matrix. So two similar matrices have the same determinants, which also makes it really nice to cross our fingers and hope we can find a similarity transformation that will convert our matrix into a triangular matrix. Now, as a final example in this video, we're just gonna do this triplet of problems. It looks pretty large actually, but because I speed things up, it shouldn't be too bad for you guys. Uh, let's go ahead and given this matrix and these three vectors, and uh, actually those four vectors, let's go ahead and show that V sub one, V sub two, and V sub three are eigenvectors of A. And then actually I'll just go ahead and start there. I'm not gonna read the rest. Well, to show that these vectors are eigenvectors of A, you wanna show that A times each of those vectors is just a multiple of the vector. That is, you wanna show that A times V sub I is equal to lambda sub I times V sub I. Well, using the magic of editing, we find out that A times V sub one, which is this product right here, is going to equal this vector, which is one times, well, V sub one. That is literally V sub one. So this will imply that not only is V sub one an eigenvector, but its corresponding eigenvalue is one. Let's do the same for A times V sub two. And when you do that product right there, you'll get 0.5 negative 1.5 and one, which is actually one half times V sub two. If A times V sub two is one half times V sub two, then V sub two is an eigenvector and its corresponding eigenvalue is one half. Finally, let's go ahead and multiply A against this third eigenvector, 
or this third vector because they want me to prove it's an eigenvector, we get negative 0 0.2, 0, 0 0.2, which is actually 0 0.2 times that third vector, which implies that V sub three is an actual eigenvector with an associated eigenvalue of 0 0.2 or one fifth. So we have successfully completed part A. We've shown that those three vectors are actual eigenvectors. Now here comes the fun part. Let x sub zero be any vector we want in R cubed with non-negative entries whose sum is one. Now what you're seeing here is actually an application that can be used in industry and uh, finance and probability really. And is probably one of the most interesting examples in my opinion for a Leontief model. So we're gonna have a vector x sub zero with non-negative entries whose sum of entries is one. Explain why there are constants C1, C2, C3, such that X sub zero is equal to a linear combination of those eigenvectors, then compute W transpose times X naught, W being this guy, times X naught and deduce that C sub one is equal to one. That's a hefty question, a big lift. Well, let's take it in pieces. Let X sub zero be any vector in R cubed with non-zero entries whose sum is one. Let's start with that. So X naught is some vector in R cubed with non-zero entries such that the sum of its entries is one. Now, we actually didn't need that for the very first part of this statement up here. Since eigenvectors are linearly independent, and that statement right there might require a recall for us. Theorem two in the text that I use, if you have a set of eigenvectors that correspond to distinct eigenvalues, then that set of eigenvectors is linearly independent. And in our case, we do have three distinct eigenvalues for those eigenvectors, right? Those distinct eigenvalues are one, one half, and 0.2. So therefore, these eigenvectors must be linearly independent. You have three linearly independent vectors in R cubed. You therefore have a basis for R cubed. Well, because it's a basis for R cubed, any vector in R cubed can be descri described by a linear combination of those three vectors. That is, X naught is equal to C1 V1 plus C2 V2 plus C3 V3. Notice I really did not need the fact that the sum of the entries in X naught is one. However, that's gonna be important in a little bit. Let's see what else we were asked to do in this part B. Oh, compute W transpose times X naught. Well, there's W right there, it's just one, one, one. So W transpose is, well, one, one, one. So that's one, one, one on its side, right? Instead of a three by one, it's a one by three because it's a transpose. And then X naught. Well, we happen to have a representation for X naught. And so you could distribute, maybe I shouldn't use this one, one, one like this. I'll keep it as W transpose for now. You can distribute the product through. And now I'll go ahead and write that one, one, one row vector. There we go, we have that product written out. Now you can see I've run out of page, but luckily I have somewhat of an empty page below me. Now computing this out, I wanna mention before I do this, this matrix right here is a one by three. This matrix right here is a three by one. The product will be a one by one, a scalar. And this simplifies down to C sub one. Now we did say that we were gonna use the fact that the entries in our original vector x sub zero were all going to sum to one. Remember how we derived this. This is actually equal to W transpose times our original x naught. But W transpose is one, one, one. Yes, x naught technically is C1 V1 plus C2 V2 plus C3 V3. But remember, it's also just some column vector x sub one, x sub two, x sub three, where if you were to somehow be able to add up those entries, they would add to one. Well, look at this product. There's a one by three matrix 
times a three by one matrix. It will be a scalar. It is X1 plus X2 plus X3, which we've said the sum of those entries is going to be one. So C1 must equal one. Now I have to be honest with you, this last part, which is the iterative process part, is usually done best using technology because it takes kind of a while to do. However, because I can speed up the video, you guys can kind of suffer through it a little bit. The whole point of an iterative process is to start with a guess as to a solution to a problem. For example, in this case, I'm gonna guess that the solution to this system right here is X sub zero. But then I'm going to take that X sub zero, multiply it by A and get another guess as to the solution to the system. Now that I get to this guess, I'll take that guess X sub one, plug it into our equation right here, multiply it against A and get our next guess, which would be X sub two. And you repeat this process over and over again until you begin to target into where the actual solution is. Now I'm showing these steps as if I'm going from some vector space to a different vector space. But the reality is because X's come from the same exact vector space, what's really happening is you have an initial guess at X naught. And when you multiply it by A, it lands your next guess right next to it, or maybe not next to it, but you know, somewhere in that vector space. Now let's pretend for a moment, the real solution is way over here. And I'm not gonna label it X sub three or X sub four, because it could take a hundred iterations before we get even close to that. But every single time we take our previous guess and plug it into this equation right here, we inch a little bit closer to that solution. Now, I have to admit, Iterative schemes don't always work, but when they do, oh man, they are awesome. So that being said, we're gonna take our X sub zero that we had from part B here, and we're gonna go ahead and create our iterative process. X sub K plus one is equal to A times X sub K. And lucky us, we have actually experienced this topic in a previous video. Several videos ago, I introduced difference equations and I had made a mention about iterative schemes, X sub K plus one equaling A times X sub K, which is exactly what we have in our current problem. And in that video, we had this theorem right after that definition of a difference equation that stated if our difference equation is X sub K plus one is equal to A times X sub K, well, actually, it ends up being that the X sub K plus one is equal to A to the power K plus one times the initial guess X sub zero. Now, if you think about the mathematics behind the scenes for that computation, that'll take a lot of work because you're taking a three by three matrix in our case and you're multiplying it by itself continuously. And I don't know about you, but I would rather not take a three by three matrix and do let's say the 10th or 20th power on it. That's just not something I'd like to do. But part of this theorem was this little piece down here that said, if X sub zero is an eigenvector of A with associated eigenvalue lambda, this entire equation compresses down to X sub K plus one is equal to lambda to the K plus one times our initial guess. We can actually use that in this problem. Here's our difference equation. And we just recalled a theorem that said, oh, this could be written as a to the K plus one power times our initial guess. Well, that doesn't seem like it's gonna help out because again, that's a matrix A, specifically the matrix that we were dealing with in this problem, which is this guy right here. And you'd have to raise that to some stupidly large power. However, if X sub zero is an eigenvector, then the K plus first iteration of X is just the eigenvalue associated with that eigenvector times the original eigenvector. Now I have to admit X sub zero in our situation is not an eigenvector. In fact, we don't even know what X sub zero is. It's just an arbitrary vector in R cubed with non-negative entries. Oh, whose sum is one. Okay, fine. But we do have this little piece right here. And this little piece says, well, actually X sub zero should be able to be written as a linear combination of the eigenvectors. 
and we actually found that the weight C1 is one. We don't know what the other two weights on this linear combination are, but we at least know this guy. So maybe it will help out. So if I replace that X sub zero with our linear combination of our eigenvectors, where C sub one in that linear combination is going to be one, maybe this will be helpful. Now remember, this lambda is a placeholder right now for whatever the eigenvalue is for this eigenvector, but this is not an eigenvector. But when I do this distribution, I will have it written in terms of eigenvectors. And that looks messy, I totally understand that. But notice, our vector x can be written in terms of eigenvectors. We know that the k plus first iteration is going to be the eigenvector times its eigenvalue. And we have three eigenvectors, so I have three eigenvalues there just waiting to be powered up. And we found those eigenvalues on the previous page. The eigenvalue for vector one is one. The eigenvalue for vector two is one half. And the eigenvalue for vector three is one fifth. Now the idea here is to see what happens as k gets massive. In other words, as k goes to infinity. So we're gonna run this iterative scheme an infinite number of times to see what happens. Now a couple notes here. First, one to the k plus first power is just one. That's not something approaching one, that's exactly one. And so it doesn't matter what power I raise it to, it will be one. So that's why the coefficient of v sub one is one. Again, one is the eigenvalue associated with the eigenvector v sub one. The eigenvalue of one half, which is associated with the eigenvector v sub two, is parked right here. And then the eigenvalue of one fifth, which is associated with the eigenvector v sub three, is parked right here. However, as k goes to infinity, we know from our calculus that this will tend to zero. And so will this. So we didn't actually need to even bother worrying about C sub two or C sub three. The reality is those terms containing C sub two and C sub three are gonna tend to zero as K goes to infinity. We'll be left with V sub one. So let's hop back and interpret what this means. I would like to know for what value of X would I multiply against A to get back x is essentially what we're saying here. And I totally understand that technically because one is an eigenvalue with an associated eigenvector that we already found, that we already know the solution to this. However, I wanna talk about the iteration scheme because the iteration scheme is incredibly important in industry. So you take an arbitrary guess as to what this vector is, and then you get out x sub one and you plug that back in and you get out x sub two and you plug that back in and you get out x sub three and plug that in and so on and so forth. And it goes on forever and ever until it eventually starts to converge to a very specific vector. Now you'd have to run the scheme computationally via computer if you were not using eigenvectors or if you didn't know what the eigenvectors were. But if you know the eigenvectors for A, then you can write this initial guess in terms of those eigenvectors. And we know that this difference equation can be rewritten as the product of a bunch of matrices times our initial guess. But that can reduce down if your initial guess is a linear combination of eigenvectors. And I didn't write it in the previous theorem because honestly, there was just no real reason to do it at that time. But because x sub zero can be written as a linear combination of the eigenvectors, if you know the eigenvectors, then this product a to the k plus one times x naught can be rewritten as just a linear combination of the eigenvectors with coefficients just like the c1 through cn, but also with the product of the corresponding eigenvalues for those eigenvectors to the k plus first power, which is exactly what we did here. And if your eigenvalues, if some of them tend to be less than one in magnitude, they will disappear as k goes to infinity 
and you'll be left with only the terms with eigenvalues of unit size or of value one, which begs the question, how often am I gonna get a matrix that has one as an eigenvalue? Well, not too often, but in industry and applications, it can actually happen quite frequently. And this loops back into stuff like Markov chains and Leontief models. This stuff is really very cool. However, there's no need for us to go any further with it. I just thought this is such a cool little application. I wanted to do it. Anyhow, there's one last little note up above I'm just gonna quickly go to. Even if A and B are similar, oh yeah, that's what we were talking about in this video, right? Huh, interesting. Even if A and B are similar and therefore have the same eigenvalues, they do not have the same eigenvectors. That's um, a big warning, actually. A lot of people think that, oh, I have a couple similar matrices, so therefore their eigenvalues are the same. That's true. And so therefore their eigenvectors must be the same. That is not true. And that has something to do with a change of coordinate system. So I will leave that alone for now because we've gone so long in this video. So let's go ahead and call it quits for today. I hope to see you in a future video, but we're done with this material right now. Have a wonderful day. Be a grand human being. It's the system of equations. We must deal with them all at once. Always looking for solutions. Positive outlook overcomes. Obstacles getting in our way comes. Effects more than we can sometimes see. Things for what they are and work together until you feel at peace. Listen close. Don't talk too much. That isn't cold. Sure, you may really hurt inside. It doesn't justify you to speak too loud and cry.